Hey, Chicago, what do you say? It's the CHGO Cubs podcast. It's another new week. The sun is out, and we're starting it with a Monday fun day because we have a great guest for you. There he is, Cubs pitching coach, and now friend of the show, second time. Officially, yeah. Tommy he came, back. he came back after the first one. He came back. It's, uh, it's a good sign. Tommy, yeah. first of all, thanks for doing this. Uh, how, how's your off season going? Hey, guys. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me again. It's always great seeing you guys. Uh, off season's going well. Staying busy. Um, I know activity is starting to, to heat up for us, I think, lately. But um, excited to get out to spring training. Excited to get to Arizona, get some, some good weather here soon. So you're, you're in Kansas City right now? Oh, yeah. Yep. Enjoyed the big, big W yeah. yesterday by the Chiefs. Um, yeah, we were joking before we got on, like, let's keep this rolling every year. The Chiefs go to the Super Bowl and I'll, I'll hop on with you guys. I think that's a fair deal. Yeah, I mean, must be like the good luck charm for some reason. Yeah. Like we're two for two now. right? It's, this it's we're well, <laughs> technically, Taylor Swift is probably one A and we're we're one B, but we're willing to take that one B. Credit to us, but considering we're all Bears fans, and like, <laughs> I can't, I still, I can't get past Ryan Pace and his decision making with this. So, yeah, gifting you guys very, very big of us to like <laughs> right. continue to do this year after year now. That's mm-hmm. right. Uh, <laughs> so, so obviously, lots to talk about. There's, there's still a lot of. Technically, there's a lot of off season left. I know, guys. There, we we've seen video of Kyle Hendricks throwing already in Arizona. And, and guys have been there, some of them all off season. But uh, how do you spend the first part of your off season? How involved are you in watching or talking to potential free agents? All all of that stuff. Yeah, we you know we start the off season. Um, it's it's easy to go from in in the the heat of what's going on in the season and, and trying to take some reflection on what's, what the season was like, what you want to focus on this off in the off season. But we try to take as much of that um, freshness and pour that into goals that we have for our pitchers heading into next year. So what we try to do right away in the off season is break down a, a big deep dive into what, what, how the season went, what we can do to continue to get better. And then we basically put together these presentations for the, for the pitchers um, that lays out like where we are, what our goals are and how we're going to get there. And so we take that approach right away. We are open and honest with our guys. We let them give us a ton of feedback of what they want to focus on. That kind of sets the foundation for our individual off seasons for guys. And then we kind of just let them go for a little bit and then have some time to, to kind of decompress there. But the more, the more we try to get at that out front and get on the same page and let guys ask questions about what they, if there's things they want to work on, if there's questions about what we're trying to, you know, evaluate, it just makes things so much smoother and so much easier. So by the time we get to spring training, we know what guys have been working on. We've been following them through the whole process, we're communicating up to this point. We know where they are in their development. We know where they are in their ramp up. And so when we get to Arizona, it's actually a pretty smooth transition. Um, we've had, you know, we have so many guys that live out in Arizona now and so many guys that try to get out there early. We feel like we've had two weeks of camp already, you know, before we even start. Uh, you, I mean, you mentioned wanting to do this, you know, in, in, in general, out, right at the outset of the off season and get, get hit the ground running. But obviously things were a little bit up in the air for, for a minute there to start with, um, you know, going out, the Cubs going out and signing Craig Council to be the new manager. Um, just kind of what was your reaction when that news came out? But also for you, what was the process like um, getting to obviously interview or, or, or talk to Craig Council um, and obviously staying on the staff with him? Yeah, I mean, be- because we took that approach of trying to be aggressive in terms of what we wanted to do, rolling stuff out for next year while it was fresh in our minds. You know, we were kind of in, in the heat in the middle of doing stuff with, with Rossi and, and some things that we wanted to focus on for next year. And, you know, and then obviously we were all, the, the news came out and it was kind of a shock at first, just with how, how much we'd have been around Rossi and how involved he's been and how much he was trying to push for things in the off season. But, you know, things happen organizationally. We, you know, we, we felt it was the right move. And, and for us as coaches in the moment, the first thing that pops up was like, all right, let's check in with Rossi. Let's see how he's doing. Let's connect with our new manager, Craig Council, and see what his thoughts are and what we can do to kind of help this transition and then find out where we, you know, where we all stand, I think, in the organization. And it was actually a pretty 
interesting exercise to go through of basically re-interviewing for your job that you that you currently have uh, because in a way you always wonder and try to get evaluated on how you do you know and i think when you have people internally that evaluate you um that are invested with you um that's one way to look at it but when you have somebody that comes in from outside of the organization that has seen you for a few years doesn't really, you know, we'd never met, but has a chance to kind of evaluate me in a different way. It was actually kind of a refreshing way of going through the off season. Um, and then getting, you know, Craig, this, this off season, just, I, I keep saying this, but he comes as advertised. I think just a calculated person, very thoughtful, uh, very intelligent about what he wants to talk about and, and how he understands the game. So I'm really looking forward to getting to spring training and getting to work with him every single day. I think there's a lot to learn. I think there's a lot for me as a person and as a coach to continue to grow. And I think it's going to be very fun to see him, you know, handle the situations he's put into this year and, and we continue to continue to grow as an organization. So Tommy, the last year, I think a lot of fans and even media, I think as well, kind of felt like the Cubs pitching overall, not just starters, not just reliever, relievers, but everyone overall took a huge step organizationally even as well. Um, what would you, what would you say was kind of like your, as a, as a pitching coach, who, what player would you say was kind of like the biggest accomplishment that maybe you helped them take another step or, or something that maybe we as fans or media have don't, might not know? Well, that's a good, that's a great question. You know, I think there were so many great individual accomplishments last year from from the group and it's it's easy to point out the justin Steele year mm -hmm. that he had not only not only because he's the first guy that i really felt like i've i've been the only pitching coach for you know that since he's come to the big leagues and continue to grow and see how he's continued to progress and and the work he's put in you could say that about Albert azalai continuing to grow kind of come into his own in that role um, but the one, like, to me, I, I think means the most was Kyle Hendricks' season. And the reason I say that is because when Kyle got hurt in, in 22, there was a ton of question marks into mm -hmm. what the future was going to look like for Kyle Hendricks. And having been with him as long as I have, I know the type of person he is, the work ethic he has. Not only did we want to get him back healthy, but we also worked well with the trainers and the, and the doctors on trying to find ways to continue to push and improve. We didn't, we, he didn't want to settle for being just Kyle Hendricks that of old, he wanted to continue to grow and he worked his tail off. We, we put, we were all over <laughs> the throwing program, the, the plyo drills, the things that he hadn't really done before trying to build this foundation success. And then to see him go out there and do what he did and, and that outing in San Francisco, when he had the, you know, the no hitter going through, I you know, believe it was eight, eight innings. You know, it's just like it, you, you, you take those, it's almost like it's Kyle Hendricks. You take it for granted, you know, but it, mm -hmm. there was so much work that went into it that people didn't see. Again, it's a credit to who Kyle is as a person and as a professional. Um, it makes me as a coach love, <laughs> love getting to come to work every day when I get to work with guys like him. And how, how big is that for, you know, the, the team as a whole, not just Kyle Hendricks proving that he can still be a solid pitcher after, you know, taking so much time off and now on the other side of 30. Um, but for young guys coming up or guys still trying to kind of get their feet wet in the big leagues, like having a guy like that who's had the experience of winning a World Series in Chicago, of a top three finish in Cy Young voting, who's had a long, successful career, um, having that guy around to, to give advice to, how big is that? It's, it's huge. I mean, and Kyle's, because of the guy he is, guys gravitate toward him. And he never shies away from conversation. He's a guy that's going to be working his tail off and always takes time to talk to the younger guys when they have questions. And, and Kyle probably, when it's all said and done, will, will be mad at me for a lot, of, a lot of things that I keep I put on his plate. But I always tell young guys, go watch Kyle. Go talk to Kyle. Go sit next to Kyle. And spend as much time with Kyle as you possibly can. And that's because of, the, of what he's been able to accomplish and the type of person he is. And, and the other thing – with Kyle, he's seen, he's gone through all of it in his career. He's been the young guy that's come up, that's been the prospect. He's been, been the guy who's been the leader 
and, and pitched in, in huge innings in the postseason. He's been a guy who now who's been hurt and been at the end of his career and had a lot of doubt and a lot of question marks against, and he's come back on the other end of that. And I think for young guys coming up, no path is ever the same. And, and they always hear, always hear the term progression and, and, and um, growth is never linear in this game. It's never the same. And Kyle's been through a lot of different things now. So, so for having to have him in the organization as, as another guy that just is easy for people to, to connect with and ask questions about, it's like having another coach and it's, it's a lot of fun. So you know what you're going to get with, Kyle Hendricks showing up at spring training. Like, he's, he's the same guy that he was last year, the year before that. At, but what about somebody like Shota Imanaga who shows up and you don't really know the guy that well, right? Like, so what, what do you know about him? And, and what can you tell us that uh, might get Cubs fans excited? Well, I can tell you right, right away, he's got a really fun personality just in the, in the few times yeah. I've been able to talk to him. Like, he's got a good sense of humor. I, I'm... You know, you, you never know when guys come, obviously, from a different culture and a different country, is their true personality going to get to show? And I think the fans of Chicago are going to get to see a pretty cool version of him. Um, and then just as, the, first of all, what we start doing right away is digging into what he's used to doing in the past. Like, what does his spring training look like? How often does he throw bullpens, face hitters? What are his goals kind of leading up to that first game of spring training? And I think we'll be very diligent about the way we ramp him up to make sure that he's completely comfortable with everything that's going on. Having talked to him a little bit, he, it's definitely the, the Japanese spring trainings and the spring trainings they have over there, they throw a lot. They throw a ton. That's just the culture they're in, they're brought up in. And it's why so many of those guys have good stuff but have such good command by the time they get to be a professional because they've thrown so much. And I think what we try to do is balance that a little bit more. I think um, we're going to, it's funny. He joked, he's like, you're going to have to tell me to stop throwing at some point. He's just, I'm <laughs> used to throwing all the time. So that'll be a fun challenge, just navigating what he's used to doing versus what we want to accomplish and help him like obviously pitch, pitch deep into a season and, and have a full season his first year in the big leagues from a stuff standpoint. I think everybody sees immediately how unique his stuff is the way the fastball plays the hoppiness to it. The approach angle, the way he he attacks a strike zone. I think there's some really really unique stuff that we can um, that we can explore there. Very, you know, you don't see a lot of lefties throwing splits in the big leagues, um, especially one that's as unique as his. Um, Want to continue to grow and develop his breaking stuff. I think that's stuff that he's talked about wanting to continue to accomplish coming over here. But again, it's just getting him around the guys, getting him comfortable getting him in an environment where he feels like he can be himself, you know, around of a lot of different uh, backgrounds and nationalities. So I think that's one thing we'll take, take priority in spring training. Yeah. I, oh, you okay. mentioned you, to, to Cody's point or to Cody's question, you'd mentioned Justin and maybe that's like the easy answer for who had like the biggest, maybe breakout or whatever last year. Um, but it was something that Rossi actually said towards the end of the season and kind of in comparison to John Lester of, like John Lester was so good because he had great seasons and was able to go out and do it again next year under the mindset of like, you know, whatever, whatever you did last year doesn't matter because you got to go out and do it again. So my question is for Justin with that same kind of understanding that 2023 was great, but now it's how can you repeat that for 2024? You know, how, how have you guys, or what does the off season look like for him um, to get him in the best position possible to, uh, you know, repeat what he did in 23 and beyond? Yeah, the, the number one thing with Justin is I, I go right to the workload. You know, how, how are we going to treat the off season to take what you did from a workload standpoint, the innings that you hit, I think it was 178 innings, to be able to continue to build on that and do it again. You know, the 180 inning mark, 185, 190 inning mark should be a goal he has every single year now. Now that he's done it once, okay, where, where were times during the year that you felt like you were getting fatigued? Where were times we felt like we could have built and done something differently? It's evaluating how we got through the season and different points of the season and how we can kind of attack that as our plan, you know, to head into this year and, and can get ahead of it a little bit. I, it, it's so easy to think, okay, I had 180 innings. 
I need to back off. I need to give myself a ton of rest. And it's important to, to rest responsibly, but it's also important to continue to build the foundation that's going to allow you to do what you, what you can do year in and year out. Um, a lot of guys that have the year that, that Justin has and had that breakout season will want to come and want to change and add so many more things. I want to, I want to add a new pitch. They want to work on this. We work on that. And that's great, but we can't lose sight of the foundation of what's made you a successful pitcher, not only in the big leagues, but, you know, basically one of the top 10 starters in the game, you know, from, from my standpoint. So there's obviously things we want to continue to work on. There's some, some pitch stuff, pitch design work that we want to continue to help build out his repertoire but also doing that without losing what got him to this point. And I think that's the most important thing for Justin, making sure we check a lot of boxes early in camp so that he's hitting the ground running once, once season starts. Uh, <clears throat> from a fan perspective, a lot of us, and maybe it's just me cause I'm weird, but we always notice every time a guy is struggling on the mound and uh, whoever the manager is, I guess Rossi last year, send you out there and, Next thing you know, after you come out there, <laughs> things change. And Jordan Wicks like pointed that out in his major league debut at Cubs convention this year. Um, he he wanted to. I think he 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 joked about how you kind of pushed him out there to say that. But we'll, we'll <laughs> let we'll let we'll let people believe what yeah. they want to believe, right? So, I guess for me, like my question is is like for a guy like Kyle Hendricks, there's not much you really need to go out there and say. You basically have said that in this interview, right? But then you have a young guy like Jordan Wicks who's in his major league debut going through the adrenal, adrenaline, the, the process of trying to just get through that first inning. How do you go about it with just all, all these different types of players and stuff? Because you've shown over the last handful of years that you've been able to go out there and just help guys calm down and get back into the zone. And there has to be some sort of skill or mind like thinking process that like mentally helps these guys. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And mound visits are such an enigma and it's such a unique, it's a, it's unlike, I, I don't know what other job that you have 20 seconds. By the time you walk out, you have 20 seconds, you know, there's bad stuff happening. You, how can you turn the tide? I can give them that one little nugget. It's going to help change, change the momentum of the game. Well, there's so many different reasons you go out for a mound visit and there's a couple of things that I believe. Number one, most of the guys don't hear a word you say. So keep that in mind. I think a lot of coaches go out there and try to chain fix everything. It's not going to happen. It might happen occasionally, but there's there when you're going out there, there is internal stuff going on in, in the guy's head every single time. I try to make it as positive as possible. I try to make it as direct as possible. The other thing you'll see from me when I go out to a mound visit. Uh, I'm big on body language. I take my glasses off. I put them on my hat. I want to look in their eyes. I, n I don't cross my arms. You know, I'll, I'll cover my mouth if we don't want to, you know, let people see what we're talking about. But I want them feeling like I'm there. I'm there to support them. I'm there to help them. I'm really big on the nonverbal side of those. Those are the nonverbal side is going to be way more impactful than what I say in a 20 second clip. Number one. Um, the last thing is. The majority of the time, what I'm trying to do is redirect the focus, right? Redirect it off the negative that's going on. Redirect off the mechanical thoughts that are going on, the second guessing of the pitch uses, all those things. Like hit him with it, hit him with a nugget, get him refocused back on what we want to do to get this guy out right here or get out of the situation. I think the more direct you can be, the more positive you can be, um, the the better guys tend to re respond in those situations. That's that's my approach to mound visits. I think. Um, having people can look at my baseball card. They know my playing career. I had a lot of mound visits when I, when I was pitching. Um, so I tried to take the little nuggets that came out of those. And, and that's just kind of my approach. I'll take humor out there at times. If I feel like a guy, if I know the player and I know how tightly wound his is, his, he is, sometimes I just try to bring some levity to the situation and remind them like, Hey, we got this Let's refocus. Um, you know, I, I, Marquee and people have asked me to get mic'd up, you know, in spring training for mound visits. And it would be such a cool exercise to do. But those are so personal and they're so raw that I know there's a lot of things I say in those that I probably don't want people to know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but it's definitely a fun. I love it. I enjoy it. Um, yeah, it's something I, I take pride in for sure. 
when you walk out there in your Jordans, that's a vibe already. So that's mm. turned things around a little bit. <laughs> I do have a question. What do you think is the best, in general, what is the best way to bring a prospect from prospect level into the major leagues to being a successful pitcher? For instance, we had a conversation on the podcast before. We were talking about certain guys. There's a lot of flexible, right now, flexible arms that could be a four or five starter in your rotation competing for that, or they could be important pieces in the bullpen. Like, do, do you tell a guy that's had just a little bit of a taste, this is your role for next year, or do you let that be decided yet in spring training with competition? Because competition can bring out the best too. Yeah, I, I much, much prefer the, you know, bringing it out in competition. I think once guys get a taste they want more of it. So they'll do whatever you want them to do in any role that they want to get back to that level. And, and so a guy like Jordan Wicks is a good example, right? Jordan came up, made seven starts, had some success. Now he's like, I just want to be in the big leagues. You know, I'm, I know I love starting. I want to do what I can do to help this team and this organization the best I can. But I also want to pitch in the big leagues. And that's ultimately what the guys want to do. And and you hit on something I think is very important that the getting a guy from a prospect status to an everyday major leaguer is, is extremely difficult. It, it is. And, and I say that because most prospects in, in baseball don't really struggle until they get to the big leagues. So when you're building these prospects and these guys are having fantastic years and careers, they, they dominate my, the minor leagues. They work their way up through the system. They get to the big leagues and they've got all, all the pack, the total package, everything you want in a pitcher, but they've never failed. They've never gone through failure. They don't know how to handle failure. They don't know how to make adjustments and guys try to do way too much when they get into that moment. And I think, what we try to do as an organization is not only build the stuff, but let's build a complete player and help them come up with a process and understand why they're having success and what could potentially go, go wrong and, and set them up. So like, Hey, you're armed with all these things are going to help you continue to grow at the major league level. And I think so many, it gets overlooked. You see a guy come up through the system. They're successful. Everybody's like, he's going to be a dominant pitcher in the big leagues. He is. So that one time he fails, how is he going to react? How is he going to, what's he going to fall back on? It's going to help him continue to grow. And I think that's the thing that we, the, the mental side of the game, the psychological side of the game that we really try to take pride in to help guys get through that as fast as possible and understand what it's going to take to be successful at the major leagues every day, year in and year out. Because it's the, the conversation started, I think we were talking about Alzali and how he embraced the closer's role. But that's a guy who, who you know, was thinking he was going to be a starter. And I was curious about at what point does he know, you know what, I'm going to focus on this reliever thing because I can make a big impact. And there seems like you have a lot of pitchers right now that are going through that same process, trying to find where they fit and how they fit in the big leagues. And I would think it's mentally very difficult for them to complete the challenge, I guess, if that's what you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the game, I mean, we have some brilliant minds in baseball. We have scouts that have been around for 50 years. We have analytical guys who can break down data with the best of them and help us understand what's going on. We all still get it wrong. Right. Like you said, this this guy's going to be a starter in the big leagues for a long time. This guy's going to be elite reliever. And the next thing you know, they flip roles, you know, and they're having success in other ways. And I think that's an important part for us as coaches, fans to understand is like you, we all may see the same thing, but it may man manifest itself in, in different ways. And and there's plenty of times we've had guys that are starters that you're ready to give up on and be like, you know what, let's put them in the bullpen and see how they can do. And the next year they surprise you and they go out and are, are solidified in the rotation. And then there's other guys that I feel like you feel like you're going to start for a long time and then you see these splashes of really elite stuff. You're like, no, nope, let's, let's put them in this role and see how it works out. The, the game tends to put you in the position to be the most successful. As long as you communicate, as long as you're open to a lot of ideas, and, and that's what I think our guys are, is they want to be the best version of themselves, whatever that looks like, and, and, and ultimately help us win ball games. Yeah, and I think someone especially that fits the mold Luke was talking about um, is Hayden Wisniewski, yep. uh, who I don't think anyone's ruled out potentially being a starter. I think he's still got um, the kind of potential that could fit into that rotation. But um, 
for 2023, some some pretty clear areas of struggle emerged for him. Um, and that's why I think that towards the end of the season, it was a lot more bullpen work than anything else. Um, and it, what's, yeah, what's the offseason need to be for him? What does he kind of need to do to kind of get back to, you know, I know that he only had that one month, September 2022, and spring training the next year, but um, he showed a lot of potential there. How can he unlock that potential? What does he need to be working on uh, in your eyes? Yeah, great, great question about Hayden. And I think he he fits in that. You guys, I'm I'm letting you know, all of you have asked great questions at this point. So I just yes, you guys credit to Well, us. technically, I haven't mm-hmm. had one yet, but that's okay. <laughs> we're, still, we're keeping count. I'm still, I'm still waiting for Brendan's question because I know it's going to be oh, coming it, at some point, and I got my notebook is. ready just in case. Wow. <laughs> he like, it's, that's that's big of him to know exactly. Like, he right. knows it's that coming. Coming. it's coming. Yeah. And just wow. know that yeah. because you said that live, he right now is sitting at work losing his mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> He's going to bump it up with some extra stuff plus questions or something. Yeah. Like <laughs> with, with Hayden, um, I think he fits so many things we just talked about, right? Came up, had some success in 22. Had his first real year of struggling, you know, at times. In the rotation, kind of working through some mechanical stuff, working through some – some mental stuff of how he wanted to use his pitches. And I think he will say once he comes to spring training that he's going to be better for having gone through that, mm-hmm. having some struggles, learned a lot about himself, learned a lot about what he wanted to focus on this off season and, and then be able to be, be ready to showcase what he can do in spring training. hundred percent. We believe he can start. Like, I, I think he's a guy that has the total pack as you look for to be a starter. He's, he's built, like a starter he's been able to, to prove he can stay healthy you know you know knock on wood that he can continue that in his career but you also see him having one of the, the best weapons in our, on our team in that slider and so it's hard when you when you're navigating a team and you're nav- navigating a season and a guy goes through a little struggle part of us is like okay can we take him out of this role where he has to feels like he has to do a lot in a five inning or a six inning outing as a starter or pitch deep into games. Can we put him in a role where he can showcase his stuff in shorter, shorter bursts at a high level while still being an impactful pitcher on your team? So I think for him to go through that last year and understand that, it, I think it broadened his horizon of one, what he wanted to work, what he uh, wanted to work on, and two, what's going to continue to make him better. Um, we know he can dominate righties. He keeps working on his repertoire to find ways to neutralize lefties. Um, you know, I don't call it being like reverse split guy. It's just we want to get everybody out, <laughs> righties, yeah. lefties, you know, neutral split, whatever you want to call it. We just want to get outs. We want to get outs at high levels. And I think he understands that and he's working hard to, to show that to us. One guy that I feel like a lot of people have forgot, mainly because he didn't pitch at all last year because he was rehabbing from Tommy John, was uh, Ethan Roberts. And I – Saw him tweet a video today uh, doing a bullpen, and I, I I love the guy's talent. Like, I was really excited when he not only came out of camp in 2022 and he kind of flashed, like, some of that stuff uh, similar to Hayden Wisniewski in a way, especially with the breaking stuff. Um, I'm curious to, to what you can tell us, at least, on what you guys' plan with him for 2024 is and working him back and maybe by the end of the year being a big part of the bullpen. Yeah, I mean, if you see the video, the slider's still there, so that's yeah. that's elite. I mean, that's good good to have. Um, you know, any any time you have guys that have missed that much time, we actually have two coming to camp, and him and Brad Wick. You know, again, another guy who who pitched at an elite level in the big leagues. Um, how do you how do you accomplish getting them to the start of the season healthy? all while still being able to showcase what they can do in spring training, it, it, there's a lot of boxes that we like to check, right? I want to make sure when they get to camp that the bullpens, all of our, our data we get in the pitch lab, make sure all the biomechanical stuff looks good, that we're checking that box. Then we get them into, into facing hitters and making sure the stuff stays the same and, and when the intensity is ramping up that he's not losing or changing things or changing mechanics and, and all these things that get to that point. In the end, we just want, I want to get it – See him get out there and compete and have fun. When you miss a year and a half, that's the thing you miss the most is, is the competition. And it's honestly, it's, it's one of the things that a lot of guys talk about when they come back from um, a major injury is that, man, it's like getting back into the flow of the game and how, how to get into competition and getting out of 
bullpen mode and all those things. So I'm just really looking forward to getting them out there, letting them face hitters, getting them in some games, and then we'll kind of evaluate where they are. Uh, we do have a live uh, super chat in the YouTube here. Sarah, if you can find that, I wanted to ask this question. Brandon uh, says, Tommy, can't wait to see you and get their signed ball. A tradition like no other. Who is on your radar that a fan might not be looking at? And that may be, you know, prospects in the system that may be not, maybe not getting as much hype as, as you know, to the general public Anybody as you guys now. maybe think yeah, internally. Yeah, so Cade Horton's out of the question. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, you know, I, I think there's going to be some – some guys that are the people will be like, who is that? You know, I think we signed um, Edwin Escobar, um, a oh, lefty Japan, who's right? been pitch, he's pitched in Japan for about four or five years now. Um, people are going to be like, who is this guy? He's going to come in and have pretty good stuff from the left side and, and a veteran guy who's been around. I think he's one. Uh, we, we, we brought a blast from the past CJ Carl mm-hmm. Edwards back. I'm mm-hmm. excited to see him in camp. Um, Always, I mean, I've loved being around Baron Carl. Um, looking forward to seeing him. You know, I think in internally, we have a lot of the same guys back. You know, so we we lost we lost Stro, we lost Fulmer, we lost Boxberger, but we have we've brought everybody back. You know, it's really a cohesive unit. So there shouldn't be too many surprises. There can be some flashes of some some guys, some names that are will be NRI guys that come to camp. Will be interested to see how they play out. But again, I, I love just getting to see the quality of arms that we're going to bring to camp. I think people will notice that. And it's so important to have depth. As you guys know, it's so important to be able to pluck from the minor leagues throughout the season. And so having guys that are going to be real contributors that r- real contributors that probably won't start the season with us, but will be big time performers as the year goes on. I think, I think it'll be fun to watch. Yeah, I think I think one thing um, you know that we saw at the end of the season um, is obviously just the the bullpen kind of faded down the stretch a little bit. Injuries crept up in September, obviously to guys like Adbert and and Mark Leiter and, and Fulmer, um, and just towards the end of the season, it, it didn't quite perform at the level they were over the summer when that group had really found its groove. Um, you know, just and, and then something Jed has talked about is like he had, you know he acknowledged that. They just, the depth wasn't there. The bullpen depth wasn't there, and partially, partially on him, right? Um, so, what have you thought of, of the additions made this offseason? Whether it's you know getting Almonte in the in the Dodgers trade, or some of the guys you listed off, Hector Neris, um, you know, going getting some bullpen guys, some potential contributors, and then also um, you know about prospects as well that may be coming up. Um, just what do you think about all that in that group and, and where the depth is at right now? Yeah, I think where we are right now on paper, I feel like is as deep as we've been in a while coming to camp. And and you saw the value or the importance of having more than just three or four guys that you can rely on every single night. Because one, that's, that's hard to do because when you put that much pressure on just say three guys every single night, you're, I mean, I can maybe say one time in the 2015 Royals, that had those three guys that it happened to work out all year, but you saw what happened the years after when they relied that much on, on those three guys in the bullpen. And so having depth, having guys you trust and having guys you can use in high leverage situations early allows you to, to spread out the wealth early in the year. And I think it's so important if you can get through April and into May where you've maybe given a guy a back to back, and only once, you know, maybe it's a lot of pitch off pitch or pitch, have a couple of days off pitch. What that does for the rest of the season is, is enormous. And I don't think, I don't, I mean, I don't think there's a real way we can quantify it. I think there's ways we internally try to project workload and, and management early in the year. Uh, you never know how it's going to work with injuries, but the importance of having guys that you trust there. So I think you bring back Abbott, Merriweather and Leiter, three guys that we, relied on at a high level. You put Hector Neris right there in the middle of that group and what he's done. Guy who's had 70 appearances, over 70 appearances five times in his career is insane. Um, Almonte, what we got in that trade, um, to be able to kind of piece him right there in the middle of that. And then you look at the guys, we internal guys, we have Palencia. I, I'm 
I love love Daniel. I like the workload he what what he's put in this offseason, what he could potentially be for that group. I mean, I think the sky's the limit for him. Luke Little, we saw him in flashes last year. I think he's a guy we really like to see take that next next step forward. And then you have Keegan Thompson, Michael Rucker. I mean, I could keep going down the list. Then where's Hayden Wesneski in this whole mix? Where's Assad? Where's <laughs> you know, Smiley. I mean, you start listing out these names and you're like, okay, yes, we you pencil these guys into like the five in the rotation and eight in the bullpen, but there's so many ways to kind of piece this thing together. Spring training always tends to work itself out, but when you're coming to spring with so many good good potential um, important pieces to, to a staff, uh, it's going to be fun to see how it all comes together and, and watch them compete in spring. We're talking to Cubs pitching coach Tommy Hadovy for a few more minutes. I, I do have a really important question. We have Brendan's question to get to before we go with you. And I have a question. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this is, you know, too in-depth or not, but who is going to be the rookie of the year in the National League, and why is it Cade Horton? <laughs> I'll hang up and listen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't have a good, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, I think that seems fair. I mean, if yeah, if, if Cade Horton is rookie of the year in the National League, Cubs are going to be pretty good. Yeah. Um, I feel good about that. You know, I, I think um, I would love to see, uh, you know, PCA put his name into that mix yeah. as well. Um, man, what, watching him play, I know we only got a flash of it, but what he can do on the field, and he's just there's just a different gear when you watch guys like him play. And you, you see the, the impact that like a Corbin Carroll had on the game and, and the Reds brought all these young guys up that can run and, and impact the game in so many ways. Um, it, it's going to be fun to see. I mean, I, we've been talking pitching, but what we've got on the position player side as well, the, the young prospects that are coming up with the Cubs is definitely a fun time to, to be a Cubs fan for sure. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned Hector Nearest and the playoff experience that he has. How important is that for, cause like with, again, we go back to the bullpen last year is like some of those guys, not a lot of experience in their specific roles, especially in the back end. You know, a lot of these guys don't have a ton of playoff experience, the, the younger guys. So, or any playoff experience, really some of them, um, how does, how does adding and injecting what Hector nearest knows his experiences, his knowledge of competing at a high level for so long and, and playing in so many playoff games, how does that aid the bullpen? Um, when you're, Obviously, guys trying to make the a lot of guys trying to make the playoffs for the first time. It, it, I think it just adds this calming <clears throat> presence. I mean, him him as a person, he definitely has that um, that personality that is just quiet and and really methodical about what he's what he's done. He's had a great career for a reason and and a long career for a reason. I think um, being able to put him right there in the middle adds this stability where guys, you know, it's one thing as coaches. You, we have Darren Holmes, who's our new bullpen coach, who obviously pitched in the big leagues for a long time, has been with teams that have been in the postseason. Um, he's going to be a, a, a good resource for guys. But it's one thing to have coaches that are in that position. It's a whole nother to have players that have been in that position. And, and it just creates this environment where guys will gravitate toward him, whether they ask him questions or not, because he's some young guys probably are going to be afraid to, to talk to him. Uh, he's such an imposing dude and he's a, you know, he's a, he's a big guy, but him being able to just show how to do things the right way and lead by example, I think will go a long way to helping these young guys continue to grow and be the best version of themselves when they come to the big leagues. Plus add that, that level of I've been here before we've done it before. It's no different. Let's go out and do what we do and and we'll be fine. So yeah, I'm really excited that we added that type of of person, that type of piece in the, in the mix. You, you mentioned nearest and he's going to be in the, in that back end, right? Uh, a guy last year, like Julian Merriweather, I mean, a waiver claim, no one, his first impression wasn't exactly great in April, but he, you guys figured him out. And like, this is one of the things that I always say on the show, I can't explain it because I'm not in the dugout. I'm not, you know, behind the scenes. I don't know what y'all are doing, but y'all figure it out. And he's like the best example to take someone who's had injury problems and you just have you you turn him into a high leverage reliever. Can you go through the process of how you guys kind of helped him get on the right track from last season? Yeah, and and I gotta start off by saying like he he took a lot of the initiatives. I'm always gonna put this back on the player because these guys work their tails off to to get better every year, and he had already started 
when we when we claimed him, that first call that I had with him, he had already had a list, like five or six things. Like, I got to do this better. I got to do this better. I got to do this better. I got to do this mechanically. And so when you already have that foundation of a guy who's who's invested in himself, it makes it our job a lot easier to be able to help guide him along that path. We're not going to get them all right, and we know that. But you, but getting it right is is not a one time thing. It's it's over time, right? And and so many times you're going to make mistakes and you're going to have conversations that that get a little askew. But we have a group and a foundation and a pitching infrastructure and an organization that that is is there to support the player, right? We have thoughts, we have ideas, but we want it to be collaborative and we want it to be something that we can all grow together. And I think there are certain guys that come into that environment that really flourish. Guys that that have an idea what they want to do have questions. We have a group of guys and staff and coaches around you that want to help you get better and, and will push you as much as you want to push. And, and that's the, something that for me that I love to get to do every, every single day. And for a guy like Julian to come in and have these thoughts of what he wanted to do. And then we just help guide him along that path. And, and we bump the slider usage and we, we, you know, wanted to attack the fastball at the top of the strike zone and, and continue to grow. And, um, yeah, and then once you start rolling, it's just like you just let the tr- you let the car go, you let the train go down the tracks. And I joke, but I say like, if we're doing our job as coaches, when you take your kids bowling and you put those bumpers in the bowling lane, I'm the bumper. That's it. That's all I am. <laughs> I'm just there to keep you from going a little too far off. Just nudge you back down the middle and let you just keep doing your thing. And guys resonate with that for sure. Well, speaking of unlocking potential, I think it's time we let Brendan ask his question. It. <laughs> This was a well thought out video. Hopefully, you can hear it and see it. Sarah, do you have it ready for Tommy? He's got his well, hold on. He's go. getting out his notepad. <laughs> yeah. this here, is here we go. The pitch doctor, Brendan Miller, with his question for the Cubs pitching coach. Tommy, first off, I gotta say before I get into it, thank you for all your hard work over the years. Watching you and Cubs pitchers have success has been one of my greatest joys as a fan. So I hope you get your deserved gratitude from fans like myself. Second, just want to throw it out there. If you ever need a pitcher of mop-up duty the day of, go ahead and give me a call. You can sign me, cheapest contract, release me the next next day if you want. I have a 23-inch induced vertical break forcing fastball. Don't worry about velocity, 70 miles per hour. Don't worry about it, but 23 inches of induced vertical break. And I am a middle infielder by training, so I can work with Nico and Dansby pregame and be their, be their double play partner if they need someone to work with. I'm your guy, very multifaceted. Uh, they're speaking to fastball shape. I'm curious to hear the process behind James and Tyone's forcing fastball. And the reason is because Tyon was very transparent with what he wanted his four-seam shape to look like during the season. And he was explicitly saying that he wants his four-seam to be around three to five inches of horizontal. And towards the back end of the season, it started to run a little bit more towards the last few starts around seven, eight, nine, ten inches of horizontal. Specifically, is this a goal in the offseason? Are you trying to get the four-seam with him back to more of a straighter profile? Or is it really not that big of a deal? And ultimately, there are other areas of his game that you think and you're hoping that you can accomplish for next season. And then generally, how often do you talk with Jameson? How often do you even talk with other Cubs pitchers uh, throughout the course of the offseason? So again, thank you, Tommy. If you need my phone number to sign me and and feel free to get us a jet as well, uh, just let me know. Thanks, Tommy. (laughs) <laughs> unbelievable uh, unbelievable but also a great question yeah you know? and before you answer i will i will point out that we are we're gonna allow the officers or whoever if that needs to be used for a restraining order in a week that's okay that's okay no as that Brennan didn't disappoint he didn't disappoint I always knew he's a very very thoughtful uh question um so yeah i, I think the the goals for jmo like when we when we look at each pitch type, and this is this is a great good example of how we do things with everybody. We try to put thresholds of where we want an ideal pitch shape to be for every pitch a guy has. And the reason we do that is because that's when we we think ideally if we're in that range is going to have the most success. Now with JMO, there's a couple of things that stood out um, to me as the year went on. Right, we were obviously adding to his repertoire in spring training. So. Um, when you're anytime you're adding pitches, nothing is created equal, right? Uh, It's in a very, very small world. Do you add a pitch and everything else stays the same? So, so obviously did we accomplish something we wanted to early in the year with the, with the slider? hundred percent. Did it affect the rest of his pitches? Potentially. 
Because I think not only did we – he started to lose some carry on the four and add more run, but he also started to lose some of the, the depth on the curveball that we had seen in the past. We tied the majority of that to some mechanical cues and things that were just out of whack and, and not consistent with what we had seen JMO do in the past. To JMO's credit, and not many guys can do this, he was working his tail off trying to accomplish mechanical things early in the year, knowing that it was going to help him down the road while struggling at the major league level, the contract you just signed and a team that's trying to win right now. At the time he, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because you're in it, you're living it. And then at the end, you see the success. He had that second half of the season again, credit to the work one, he was able to put in to identify what he needed to work on and then trust the process of getting it done as the year went on. The unique thing with JMO and, and horizontal movement isn't always created equal. This is why I would tell Brennan specifically about JMO. If we maintain carry and add horizontal, that's not terrible. If we lose carry and add horizontal, that's not ideal. Like we don't want to trade off there. So as the year went on, we were noticing there was more horizontal um, there, but he was also maintaining some of the carry that he normally had. Yes, in an ideal world, we'd love to live in that five to seven range or even less. If we can say under six, that would be ideal while maintaining carry. That's that more true cut ride profile that we're looking for. Um, but if we're able to add more total movement without sacrificing somewhere else, that's not a, it's not a bad thing to do. So, so I think as the mechanical stuff that JMO worked on continued to show itself more and more as the year went on, you started seeing the pitches, started seeing added depth on the curveball, and not only just the movement of the pitches, but the command of the pitches and what he was, what he's been working on. So communication with JMO is actually probably as smooth and easy a transition in the off season as anybody because of, what we had worked on leading up to to that point. Um, and then it was easy to just lay out this program for JMO, set some high lofty goals of what we wanted to hit early. And he's one of those guys who just doesn't take a lot of time off. So we were able to kind of dive right into the initiatives that he wanted to do. Um, JMO, it's not like this with everybody, but JMO is probably a three or four text a week guy. You know, it's a guy that I rarely go a week without talking to, whether it's because of fantasy football or something mm -hmm. to do with Chiefs, um, sprinkle in some mechanical videos and some some work he's doing and putting in. That's this is kind of the environment we created. Guys, we, we might be texting about fancy football trades or or DraftKings or uh, the the bullpen you just threw <laughs> yesterday. The communication's kind of wide open there, but it's been fun to see the work he's put in. Well, be careful because if Tyone is a three to four text guy a week, if you get Brendan's information, yeah. you're yeah. going to get like a hundred a week. So no, I'm just letting you know. Daily, it'll be daily. Yeah, stuff. just I'll, we don't want to go down that road. I'll keep it. I'll keep it. I won't send it to Brendan. Don't no, worry. we'll like, keep I'll, that on the DL. Yeah, he'll he'll bother me for it, and I'll just ignore him. <laughs> Thank no you worries. so much. For, I have, so much. For I have oh, one, one more quick thing. One, one yeah. more thing, and this is yeah. nothing to do with pitching at all. This is a very much me question. Jordan. All right. Uh, you probably know this girl. Her name's Lauren Wisdom. She is the only person I know that has a Tommy Hadavi jersey. All right. <laughs> She's, she hangs out in left field every game. She's literally one of the first people to arrive. She hangs out by where you guys come in all the time. So, but the question is, is what was the first experience like meeting a fan that had your jersey? <laughs> Yeah, that's not a family member, you know. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. not a family member. There you have go. it because I gave it to him for Christmas. Um, yeah, you know, I, I just think it speaks to the Cubs organization, the fans, the people. It's it's what sells this place to free agents. Like you're in a community. It's not a team set in a city. You are in a community. We walk to the ballpark every single day take pictures with fans. You see the same group of people that are there every single day. Um, I always feel like I got to dress somewhat nice because I'm going to be on Instagram with how I look, you know, just wearing what I walk to the park in every single day. But again, it's just, it's such a unique experience. It's just, it's just nothing like that in this game. And, and to be able to, to interact with the fans at an intimate level, to get to know people at an intimate level. And then I, I will, as long as I'm around this game and whenever I'm done, the one thing I will say about anything, is there's nothing better than walking to the left field bleachers to go to work before a game. The fans, the people, the atmosphere, um, it's just nothing like it. And, and, and I think it's just because the, 
the 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 people that are in this city and, and the support the Cubs. It's just you put you feel like you're family and, and you're fighting together. And, and yeah, I love getting yelled at and booed and, and told me that I, that I stink and I could be doing better. And, and I'm going to say the same to them when they're trying to chug their beer in the seventh and can't get it all down. You know, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna go back and forth. But I, you know, I, I just think it's a unique environment. I love it. I'm, I'm very um, lucky to be part of it for as long as I have. Well, we're really lucky you joined us for like 55 minutes or whatever it's been. Really pre- appreciate you being so gracious with your time. Have a great uh, last couple days of the off season. Pitchers and catchers, just a handful of days away, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Thanks Tommy. Tommy. Cubs pitching coach Tommy Hadovy. Uh Cody, quickly tell us about Circa Sportsbook. Oh, man. You know, Tommy is a huge Chiefs fan. If he's still watching here in the in the background, I did not bet against Patrick Mahomes yeah, on Sunday. There's just no way it. you can possibly do it. Man, right. I, I made the mistake the week before. Couldn't do it two weeks in a row. And thankfully, I made a lot of money on Circa yesterday. All right? Three reasons why I love it. The high, the, uh, the high app limits, the transparency. They, do, they don't limit players based on their winnings. Every player has the same limits, unlike other books who do limit winning players. They encourage bettors to download and explore all sports betting apps uh, available uh, to compare each lines from each sports book. Uh, and then the customer service, it's second to none. Again, I, I, I hate chatbots. I really I, I could do without them, right? Uh, Circa, they don't have chatbots. They, they, all aspects of the app are being run by the same team that runs the main Circa Sportsbook at Circa Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. All right, so download the Circa Sports Illinois app at circasports.com slash Illinois-app to sign up today. Also, be on the lookout for Circa events, watch parties, and tailgates. If you or someone you know may have a problem with gambling, call 1-800-GAMBLER, text GAMB to 833-234, or visit areyoureallywinning.com. I also won big... Uh, on the Chiefs yesterday, credit didn't, to you. Didn't bet against them. Also, one pretty easiest big. win of the, of the um, weekend. And I, I was so hyped that it really made me want to go to Midtown Athletic Club mm. and get a nice workout in. Nothing makes you want to lift more than winning bets. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Lift your cash over your head. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Midtown <laughs> Athletic Cl- Club's got four Chicago Land <laughs> locations: Palatine in the Northwest Suburbs, Bannockburn in the North Shore. Willowbrook in the Southwest Suburbs and Midtown Athletic Club and Hotel in the middle of Bucktown and Lincoln Park. Uh, Midtown Palatine has actually launched a multi-million dollar transformation of the club, which will be complete in early 2024. So that's right now. And then Midtown is offering no initiation fees this January at their Bannockburn, Palatine, and Willowbrook locations. So if you want to get signed up with no initiation fees, you only got a couple more days to do so. So make sure you go get it done. There's something at the clubs for everyone, whether you're single, you got a family and kids, you're looking to make uh, lifestyle changes, whatever, something at the club for everyone. Midtown Chicago is the nicest fitness club I've ever been in. You know, at every single floor is like is it something new. The, you know, the, first, the first floor has the locker rooms with the saunas and all that kind of stuff. And, like, there's different courts there. The second floor has a, has a restaurant, a bar, and a golf simulator and yoga studios and stuff like that. So it's it, every floor is something great. You find something that you need to do there. Um, wherever you want to go. And then if you want to you know, take a nap, there's, yeah. there's hotel rooms upstairs. You want to you spend the night there. You can get married up there. Yeah, you, you get want. married up then there. Then they have another floor that's mm. just cash, and you can just roll around in Yeah, it. pretty much. Don't want the facts um, in the way a good story right. on that. But. That's right. But, yeah, yeah. so the, their cool club features include the super luxe locker rooms with wet and dry saunas and premium amenities, amazing outdoor and indoor pools and hot tubs, a collection of boutique fitness studios with more than 100 classes per week included in the membership, and they're not just gym quality. The spaces are boutique quality they got the best tennis courts and programming in the sport midtown has indoor and outdoor tennis pickleball and paddle tennis it's usta professional quality all the way so go check out midtown head over to midtown.com slash chgo to find out more and to tour the midtown athletic club nearest you what do you guys think of uh, morosi saying that justin turner likely will sign this week and listing the cubs as one of the four or five teams that it could happen I mean, it's um, you know, not, it's not like the he's not going to play third base anymore. Like he's not a third baseman anymore, really. I think I don't think he even played third. He base. played mate. Mo- mo- uh, I can't talk. Mo- he, mainly. he mainly played like DH first base last year. For yeah. The for the Red However, they did sparringly put him at second or third base at times, but he was like negative defensive runs yeah. and negative. He's, outs he's above a bat. Average. No, yeah. he's a, veter- he is a bat. he's a veteran yeah. bat. You could add to your, he is a bat. He definitely and, wouldn't and be your full-time third baseman. Yeah. He's a, sure. he's a, he's a good bat still that would be helpful in this lineup. 
um, you know, depending on where you put him. Um, you know, I don't, I put him on kind of the same level as I do with like, I'm looking at, you know, Brandon Belt or JD Martinez, right? Like guys that, you know, veteran dudes aren't quite what they used to be, but still strong hitters that can absolutely help this lineup. But, um, you know, I mean, it, for me, it's still like Cody Bellinger is the number one guy they need to get uh, as far as the position player hitting side goes. So um, while those would be solid complementary pieces, it wouldn't, it should not take away from their ability to go also get Cody Bellinger too. Yeah, I mean, I think you remember how Jed said at Cubs convention where like some of the rumors that get out there just are blunt, like bl- like plain and simple, not true. Mm-hmm. I feel like, like this is one of them. And this isn't like to discredit our guy, John Morosi. He came on our show at winter meetings. Great dude. Uh, I know he got the, the thing wrong with Otani, but overall he's been, he's very credible. Jed literally said that they need left-handed bats. So personally, considering they already have Michael Bush to play first, or, and Morel to DH, I'd rather have Brandon Belt if out of those three, like, veteran-type, like, bench bats slash, you know, guys who have shown that he can still hit at a later age. Brandon Belt was pretty solid with Toronto last year. N- nothing against Justin Turner. I'd take him. Like, he's, like, 38, 39 years old, and he's still hitting. Uh, ab- above league, a- league average hitter when you look at way to create yeah. plus. But... Again, they need left-handed bats, man. They got they got a lot of righties in this lineup. I saw Bo Bichette. Uh, somebody asked him, like, who's out there that could help your, you know, help a team? And he threw out two names. He's like veteran guys, like J.D. Martinez and Justin Turner, are still out there. So I think he also has a good reputation around the league as mm-hmm. a veteran player that can help young guys coming up on and off the field. You know, mm-hmm. it, to me, it sort of fits. It, it's not apples to apples, but it fits the mold of. Mancini last yeah. year, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I think it's a, he's a much better player than Mancini at this point in his career still, but I think it's somewhat similar. Yeah, yeah I think with that, that group that I named with Turner, yeah. Belt, mm-hmm. or, or Martinez, I think for me, as far as hitting-wise goes, like, I, you know, if I'm the Cubs, I'd rather have J.D. Martinez because, I mean, he had, what, 135 WRC plus last year um, with LA. He's, he's 35, so he's not going to get a long-term deal, like crazy high money, right? Um, I guess the only drawback is that he can't like play first base. He's only DHing pretty much at this point of his career. Yeah. Um, so you are bringing in someone that can't really help you defensively. However, he's a very good bat that would be um, that that would again provide a very solid bat into that lineup. And you know, at least at least you have your full time DH in that sense. So um, Turner would be a nice pickup too. But I, I think if I'm the Cubs and I want any of those three guys, it's probably JD Martinez for me. Also, Cubs killer. You know, every time they bring someone in like this, it doesn't go well. <laughs> so, based off vibes alone, nah, I'm good, brother. You're good. But what about Hector Neris? You like you like I like Neris? Hector Neris. Yeah. No, it, it, I mean he's a proven arm, and Tommy talked about yeah. it a lot. Like he's a they needed a guy that was proven and has had success. I mean, this guy has won a World Series. He's had a ton of playoff success. I know, like the thing that everyone is like the scouts and everyone that or, you know, criticizing is the drop in fastball velocity. Mm-hmm. But other than that, like... He just had his best season yeah. ever. But, yeah, I, I think I think one thing with him is that, like, you look at some of the underlying numbers and, like, his the bad bit was really, really low, right? And yeah. and the, the strand rate, like, the amount of runners he left on base, really, really high, like, way higher than average. I think you can... I think you can kind of expect a little bit of regression more to the mean in those two areas, which... So, I mean, means he, meaning he probably won't have or he may not have as great of a year as he did this last season results-wise. But he's still, yeah, like Tommy said, like we've all said, a really good pitcher, back-end pitcher with like, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth inning experience even, who is going to come in and and be that experienced veteran reliever that the Cubs just didn't have last year. Like Mm -hmm. they didn't have anyone with long track record of success in that bullpen. He's he's one of those guys. Like this is a perfect addition for him. And I think, you know, a lot of people in the chat have asked like, is he the closer? It's like, no, I still think Alzelay is the closer, but Alzelay is not going to be asked to close every single game or else his arm will fall off before September. So, He's ha- he has the experience to where the Cubs could, on certain days, use him as a closer if they have Abbott down for a day. You know? Merriweather, so, too. Yeah. Merriweather. Like Tommy said, there's, there is depth, and I think it's actual good depth. Of course, some of these like minor league signings and the young guys, like in like the, a lot of the internal guys, like you got to 
you got to make you got to f- unlock something or hope guys bounce back like a Keegan Thompson, like O'Hayden Wisniewski. But with these guys that are going to be in the back end, I feel pretty good about what they got there. Not a hundred percent of the bullpen moves are going to work out. This one seems like it has way more upside yeah. than a lot of. There's a lot to play for the, too, considering that's he right. could, like you know I think if he makes sixty appearances, he gets the the player option. Yeah. Uh, if not, then the, it's a team option, so the Cubs could be done after this this year if they want to. Yeah, so like performance wise, he's got a lot of incentive yeah, to perform for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, not a hundred percent. If you're looking for a hundred percent, then Empire today is the place you want to go. <laughs> you get to shop at home convenience, the right product for your needs, quick and professional installation, and a low price guarantee. Empire today is the best place to get new flooring. So of course they have copycats, but nobody can live up to their quality, service, and speed. So competitors try to advertise low quality products. Empire doesn't play that game. They eliminate all the trash. They get all of the low value, low quality products that you can buy that you can get at a big box store. And they say, no, 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 you don't want that. This is what you want. These are the free agents you want to put in your house. And they keep shopping for floors simple with a curated product selection. They also have that virtual floor designer. You just snap a picture and you can see how the new floors will look in your room at home. And they pride themselves as their convenient shop at home service because they also service their own home warranty, uh, own warranties, I should say. If an issue does arise, just call Empire. They'll service the warranties themselves. They don't have to have you track down a manufacturer's phone number. Schedule a free in-home estimate today. All listeners... Here at CHGO can receive a $350 off discount when you use the promo code, again, four most important letters in all of the world, CHGO. Restrictions apply. See empiretoday.com slash CHGO for details. And if you're in the market for a new vehicle, then we've got great news for you here too because our partner Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram in Fox Lake is starting their Ray Resolution with the start of something new sales event. And you know what that means? It means you'll be able to shop an incredible savings on every new vehicle in stock because they want to clear out the lot and make room for their new 2024 vehicles. For a limited time right now, get up to $9,000 off new Jeep models with their dealer discount. And that's not all. Shop their last call on remaining 2023 Dodge Challenger and Charger models, including Hellcat, Scat Packs, and more. Dodge is the most powerful muscle car brand out there, so you don't want to miss out on their last call with over 20 Dodge muscle cars to choose from. At Ray CDJR, you're always able to shop one of Chicagoland's largest inventories and drive home with more money in your pocket than you ever expected thanks to the Ray Price Promise. Don't miss out. Shop great deals all month long. And save big because Ray CDJR is making buying a new vehicle more affordable than ever. Fans get a free oil change when you mention CHGO at the Service Center or when you book online at raycdgr.com slash service. All you have to do is schedule a couple days. Time's running out. January 31st, get that free oil change. If you're in the market for a new vehicle, then you got to schedule with the team at Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram because they're the only team we recommend. Visit them today on Route 12 in Fox Lake. For more information, visit Ray CDJR in Fox Lake or raycdjr.com, serving the community since... 1963. Tommy Hadaby on the podcast today, outstanding for like, I don't know what it was, maybe like 55 minutes like uninterrupted. 50 minutes, something like that, yeah. We didn't even do ads. Right. No ads. <laughs> that, we just skipped them. Yeah. That, that, was my, that was one of my favorite things of the week. My second favorite thing was the guy on Jeopardy. Dude. Lloyd. Oh, Lloyd. Yeah. Lloyd. Lloyd on Jeopardy. Lloyd. He, I tweeted this from the CHGO Cubs account. Honestly, the guy deserves a free CHGO diehard membership. I'm just saying. <laughs> Shout out to our guy, Brian, who just became a diehard th- yeah, like that? today. Mm-hmm. Um, he's in my Twitter space all the time, and I kind of talked about what we're going to be doing a lot more in Discord and stuff and um, you know other things that diehards have the incentive of. So, again, related to Lloyd, I would love to give him that because he did yeah. what every yeah. Cubs fan – would have done in that instance on Jeopardy. Um, I don't care that Albert Pujols is going to go be a first ballot Hall of Famer one day. That was the most Cubs fan thing that that guy could have done. So credit to him. I forgot to give Sarah the clip. Basically, he gets asked a question where the question or the correct answer, if you will, on Jeopardy is Albert Pujols. It was under the the, uh, category of bald is beautiful. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, so. Bosby. And, and, and he, he throws the, out who is the wretched? The wretched. Who is Albert, the wretched? Albert Pujols. Albert Pujols. Pauses for a second. Go Cubs. Go Cubs. Yes. Um, Outstanding. He no, was yeah. on uh, Crawley's podcast. Uh, like literally, like the night that that video went viral, he was on the Fly the yeah. W Cubs podcast. Um, well, you mentioned new diehard Brian. You also want to shout out Jefferson, Matt, Joe, Colin, Mark from Smokestaff Barbecue, and Vladimir. All new diehards with oh. us. So shout you guys out. You guys are joining in on the fun. Everyone that's not in, or that's not a diehard right now. Um, you should hit these guys up because they they can tell you how fun it is to be a diehard. Get access to the Discord, um, you know, discounts on merch and events, all that good stuff. So, a card. I was in the, the dis- I got I got the card here. I was show in the, the Discord on Saturday, obviously because we didn't have a show on Saturday or Sunday. The day that the Nara signing happened, right, I was in the right. Discord and we did a nice card. Look, we had a nice little conversation yeah, with, with the voice chat situation. Can we switch to, uh, to Luke's camera? Quick? I got Yeah, hold on. Like no, this. No, that, no, which not, side do you want me to show? This side here? No, it works. I good, just got I just got a Costco card within the last two weeks. This is way more valuable. You know that viral video of what the, a of freak show Costco is. Let me tell you, <laughs> you know, people walking around in there, running around with these giant carts like they're oh, in yeah. the well, Daytona Five Hundred. You, you know oh, the viral you video got, from like a year ago. Yeah, you can see it from where. Yeah. It close. It's the. It's like I think it's like at Boston College, like last year. There's this viral Look video of this guy is. showing oh, like yes. a card yeah. to this girl, yeah. and she's looking at it like whoa. But and right. then when you zoom in on it, it's like she's looking at a Costco card. That's how people should look at the Die Hard card. Oh wow! Content just thought of it. You know what we're doing today? Who's the actress that did the uh, hot sauce thing? Hot oh, ones. Sydney Sweeney. Hot ones. Sydney Sweeney. Oh, Sydney Sydney Sweeney. Sweeney. Oh, yeah. And it, that's been going around the internet. She's looking all like all yep. excited. She's looking up. And what we put in the corner, the new Die Hard card. Die Hard card. Boom. Boom. Die Hard membership. Content. Somebody get on that. I like that. I don't know how to do it, but somebody should get on that right now. That'll be me because I do know how to do that. Huh? (laughs) Credit to you for knowing how to do it. Credit to me for having the great idea. There we go. (laughs) Uh, what else do you want to talk? We got to, we have any, oh no, we're, we're seven we're, minutes late today already, huh? I'm surprised the Hawks guys aren't yelling at us. They're not. They're over Hawks there. are on at three o'clock. Oh, oh I think, uh, we got I do, time. I do think it is important to mention though, our show for the, uh, tomorrow through Thursday is going to start at two thirty. Yes, that's true. Cause we have a oh. new show. Oh we're Starting yeah. at two thirty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Starting at two thirty moving forward. All right. <laughs> Luke's like I'm new here. I didn't know this. Uh, news uh, this to me. is also news to me as well. Content ideas. Luke, That's where I. This really was, is news Luke to me. Was at the out in, he was out in Mexico drinking That's pina right. coladas yeah. in the beach all sure. weekend. So he yeah. was. That was definitely what he was doing. He missed yeah. the memo. Bart Tuesday says, through Thursday, though, chickens. we will be at two thirty this week. Two thirty mm-hmm. Tuesday through Thursday. Yeah. So I better not show up when I normally show up because I'll just be sitting around here doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, tomorrow we're going to try and continue our conversations from Cubs convention, right? We still have Adbert Alzali to talk to. That's well, true. Of course, is a vibe. He is yeah, a vibe. He's a vibe. I, by the, and by the way, Tommy Hadovy didn't quite take the bait on my uh, rookie of the year question. No. Kate Orton, yeah. yeah. He, it was a good answer, though. PCA, he's buying PCA. He is. You could, you, could tell, you could tell Tommy has professional media training. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and he's done it before. I would just like to say that not only did he say I asked one good question, but multiple. Yeah. And then Ryan got, I got one. one. Ryan got Luke one. Luke never got one. I didn't get Tommy one. Tommy Hadovy, I mean, I love Ben Zobris, and he's a, 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 the World Series MVP, but I think... You're going to bump him? No, no, no. Uh-oh. I'm not bumping him, but, like, Tommy Hadovy's, like, right there with Ben Zobris, well, we which, is, which is high, high praise, all right? If we get Tommy in studio, would he then... Mm, that, I, I think that's something that Ben... Like ben has been live with us twice. Yeah. yeah. One thing I you're... I feel like... He needs to sign the W flag. There you go. You would... You could create some great content for yourselves, build your brand, right? Like if you could just put together all the people that says, oh, that's a great question. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> but they need to put the pause and then Cody on there. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just, that's a great question. It could be anybody asking that's the true. question. It's got to be, that's a great question, Cody Del Mendo. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. next time we talk to Tommy, before it starts, we'll have to remind him, listen, if you think it was a good question, please make sure you drop my name at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, say, say the name. <laughs> Some people, you will hear players throughout the season just dropping those randomly, just dropping people's names. You're like, what kind of exchange was made for that? Right, yeah. That's a great question, Ryan. He seemed, pre- question. He seemed pretty excited about Carl Edwards Jr.'s yeah. return, too. Well, I think World he was Series, a popular guy. World yeah. Series guy. You know what would be exciting? World Series champion, Carl Edwards. Getting to 100 likes before Ooh, we yeah. get out. Because we we're at 75. 75. How do we only have 75 for Tommy Hadovy? 55 minutes uninterrupted. We have 150 and 150 people. plus people in here? Unbelievable. Come on, man. 
going to say. We're here on a Monday talking about all the things yeah. that are happening. Tommy Hadovy joins us after his Chiefs win, go yeah. back, win to go back to the Super Bowl. Like yeah. He could be celebrating still right now, but instead could he's be. hopping out yeah. with us. He could have already gone to Vegas and just, like, you know, tried to go find Travis Kelsey and Pat Mahomes just, like, vibing out. Yeah. No, nope. he came on our show. You got to fight. And that is who? Travis Kelsey. Uh, yeah, but he say, who is that the, paying homage to? the Beastie Boys. Thank you. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I was confused, sorry. Licensed to L. Oh, I know. I know the Beastie Boys. You know, we used to have, in high school, we had this, we had to do a 12-minute run twice a week. It was part of, you know, Fitness in America or whatever. You'd have to go around the laps. For, you, had to run, you had to run for 12 minutes and, and come up with, you know, you had to do at least a mile in 12 minutes, which, come on. So I was, of course, lazy and uninspired. Yeah. And I had one of the old-fashioned Walkmans where you could put the cassette in and and I found out that I could actually walk a mile pretty easily in 12 minutes. And so I would just go around with my Beastie Boys, licensed to ill, nice. going around. I'd walk the thing. Everybody else would be running by. I'm like, what are you guys breaking a sweat for? <laughs> and that was, that was the cassette I played, licensed to ill. And that's why he... You got to fight. Oh, I know what a cassette is. I used to have a Walkman but like with a CD Walkman. I wasn't, the, it wasn't there was so, There was some great satisfaction in being able to close the cassette into the Walkman. It was like when you first snapped those first I, uh, mm-hmm. cell phones closed, the Razor or whatever, yeah. well, now hanging we, up on somebody, snap. Now yeah. we know Lazy Luke. Now we know why he talks about sports instead of actually playing it. That's right. I was uninspired. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to run a mile <laughs> twice a week during school? I'll walk it. I was the same. I was always <laughs> finishing a last when I'll it walk. came to doing laps. The teacher would always be like, what's wrong? They're like, oh, hip sore. Got to walk it today. Oh, there goes my knee. Yeah. Oh, my leg. I, I ran solely because if you finished, once you finish, you could go to like the locker room and shower and then like leave. So if, if you got done quicker, the quicker you could be out. I of didn't have class. to shower. All I'd done has been walking for 12 minutes. I just went straight to class. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Credit to you. Credit to you. Credit to me in 1990. <laughs> my baseball coach was my gym coach, so I couldn't walk. Okay. Uh, did you guys know that it's it. getting easier for businesses to switch to electric vehicles? That's something we can all get behind for the health of the planet and for the well-being of all of us who share it. I did actually know that, Luke. The electric grid is evolving to meet your cleaner energy needs as we all move with confidence toward an electric tomorrow. Whether you have one delivery van or a whole fleet of shipping trucks, ComEd can help guide you to make the changes that make sense. Well, that's interesting. What should business owners do, Cody? Well, chat. Ryan, Luke, I'm listening. you got to go to comed.com slash clean, all right, where you can learn more about the resources, fleet rebates, and infrastructure incentives available to help businesses go electric. If you own a business, don't wait. Start making your plan today to switch to electric vehicles. Good for business. Good for the planet. Good for all of us. Go to comed.com slash clean. Did you say, I, I was thinking about the hot of the interview and I was distracted. I lost track of what you were saying for a second. Did you say comment.com slash clean? Yes, Luke. Okay. Go now and see how going electric connects us to a better way of doing business and a better future for generations to come. Bruh. That Barb was, was asking if Ryan freak. was a gymnast. Are we going to do Olympic coverage from Paris this year? Are they sending us to I'll Paris? Go. They I'll should. Go. If, if, yeah. if any podcast is going. Definitely us. Sure. I got the hookup. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Don't don't let me talk myself into it, and and don't we tease me. Total insight. Yeah. yeah, inside scoops. Yeah. You rapping us? Did you just <laughs> give me the rap? Did you just, just give me the hook, the Sarah? She's giving us the Sarah well, ones. I just looked at I just looked at the time, and I was like, Blackhawks guys have 15 minutes oh, until they're plenty, plenty of time. Oh, plenty of time. <laughs> plenty of time. Hey, by the way, their PR guy's leaving to join the Cubs. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Stein Miller. No, sorry, sorry Mario. Steiny. I, I, now we're gonna have I to hear call he's him been Steins. in, I hear he's been in our Steins? offense. I don't remember what they called him at the Hawks. Is it Steins? Steiny good, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. Milwaukee people for sure. And Marquette. Whitefish Bay yep. specifically. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Steiny, could we get uh, Cody Bellinger for show today? No problem. No problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yes. Uh, make sure you sign up for that Die Hard program. By the way, we have a little tavern-style thing we're going to tell you about tomorrow that's coming up starting this I'm gonna week I'm going to be well. on it. You're going to be in on that tomorrow, on tavern the, style? On the tomorrow one, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. That's what we call it. Tavern Star. That's what we, we call it. Tease, and uh, most likely we're going to have uh, Adbert Alzali yeah. for tomorrow's guest. One more thing before we get out of here. Uh-oh. I just want to say what he said, what Tommy Hadovy said about like the fans and all that stuff. When I asked him about the, oh yeah, when I, mentioned the, when I mentioned the Lauren Wisdom thing, shout out to Lauren, by the way. She watches this show. Credit to her. Um, 
I, I just want to emphasize that like the coaches and the players and all that. Like I, as much as like sometimes, especially at like big fan conventions like Cubs Cubs convention when they can't sign everyone's stuff or they can't take a picture with every single person. Right. I do think that they genuinely care a lot about the people who really support and Lauren is someone who is like she she probably you can argue she might be a bigger Cubs fan than me considering she goes and stands outside like the players entrance all the time oh, bigger than Bleacher credit, Jeff arguably credit oh to her. boy yeah. credit to her now and so like I, I just for people who think that these guys just show up to like do their job and don't care about anything else like please go back and listen to him talk about like the fans and like Wrigley and all these things because to me whenever like that that uh, the phrase that my guy Dom Frederick came up with that the Cubs ended up using, it's different here. Like it really is different here. It's, it's this the, there's something intimate about the fans, players, coaches, and everything in Wrigley Field and and all of that. So that really that was all, probably my favorite part of the entire conversation. Actually, all that was missing was him finishing it by saying baseball is better at Wrigley. Yeah. Huh? Thanks for go. checking out the CHGO Cubs podcast. Back at two thirty. Two thirty tomorrow. Two thirty. Uh, Until then, thanks for watching, and of course, fly the W.